folks, I'm Tom Basso and welcome to Board Game Breakfast. As this video is airing, I'm currently flying back from Germany and landing back in Miami and we're ready for another full week of stuff. Essen is over. We'll probably be talking about the games that came out there for a while, but that's what we do here. We talk about new and interesting board games. Lots of stuff to look forward this week. I'm glad you're joining us. Before we get started in the show, I do want to remind you that if you want to hang out and play games, with us over the course of the year. We have multiple different conventions, Dice Tower West and Dice Tower East at their respective websites, DiceTowerWest.com, DiceTowerEast.com is a way to come and play games. Later on in the show, I'm going to be showing more games that we're adding to the library and it's going to be at all these events. But be that as it may, it's time to get back to what I found on the internet this week. So here we go. Okay, so some interesting things I found. First of all, Arby's makes a board game reference, a ticket to ride and an ad, or ticket to fried. Ad ah, is just funny. It's uh, Arby's doing some advertising, obviously, but it's just it's always fun when we see them use a game that we know. Uh, in this article, in uh, Sirius XM, we see Graham Nash uh, talking about how he used to play Risk with Jimi Hendrix on Acid and how Jimi Hendrix was unbeatable at Risk, which I don't think is a thing since Risk has so much luck in it. But, eh, who knows. Board Game Atlas has bought Board Game Prices. Board Game Prices was a place you can go in and type something in and a game in and find out how much it costs at various places on the internet. Board Game Atlas is a place you can go and type something in and find out where you can find information about that board game on the internet. Now they've joined forces. If you're looking for a laugh, you can always watch the Dragon's Tomb YouTube channel. Of course, hilarious. And this week he did How to Play Small World and I just... I really got a good laugh out of some of the stuff he did there. And this is pretty cool. Uh, someone, uh, there's rules on the internet apparently to make, uh, to take, you know, famous movie uh, with zombies and stuff in it and take Last Night on Earth and mix it with Mall Madness to get that classic in the mall zombies thing. And there's a YouTube video, you can find it in the description here, where it shows how they combine those. In the happy news, a new company, All Aboard Games, was started by a Montreal man who quits his job, says the news article, to inspire kids to replace screens with board games. He's going around to different schools and teaching them board games and getting them involved in board games. Fantastic. I'm very pleased about that. Board Game Geek last week did a ton of live stuff on their Twitch channel from Essen itself. So if you want to see all these new board games, they scheduled 40 hours worth of uh, interviews with all these different publishers to tell you about these board games. Ars Technica has done an article about Ticket to Ride Maps Ranked. And this is more of a passing interest thing. I'm not really recommending this list per se, because while they rank the maps, they don't really give a reason why they rank them. Also, it's completely wrong. Uh, I'll be redoing this list from my opinion, obviously, in the future. And I found this uh, article or, or this this interview, the legacy of board games. This was on TiVo with uh, Joan Moriarty and Jonathan Kay. They both wrote a book about board games and how you can use things you learn from board games in real life. Hey, if you have something you'd love me to talk about on this segment, send it to me at tom at dicetower.com. Meanwhile, let's keep going. Hi, everyone. I'm Doug Jr. And I'm Doug III. And you're watching a Fellowship of Meeples with Doug and Doug Gaming. Well, we're continuing our countdown. We are to our number one spooky game, which is... Mansions of Madness. Yeah. <laughs> no big surprise there. Anybody that knows us knows that we love Mansions of Madness. This is an awesome game. This is the second edition, which of course uses an app. It's a story-driven game, driven by the app, but there's a lot of interaction and a lot of decisions to make. Mm -hmm. Well, in Mansions of Madness, you will take on a character that will be exploring throughout a scenario which will be dictated by the app. You'll run into different clues and places to explore, and when you choose an area, the app will tell you what happens. For example, if I wanted to explore more of the house, I would move over here and interact with this token right here. Then the app, being kind of like a dungeon master would be in Dungeons & Dragons, would tell me what lies beyond the room. Also, the app might direct us to place monsters like this deep one, or perhaps this cultist. 
In this game, in order to solve puzzles and fight enemies, we will be rolling these dice to determine the success or failure of our scenarios. The elder signs being the stars means success, while blanks obviously is a failure, and then clue tokens or clue signs, they can change it up a little bit. Right now the game is telling me to roll my lore, which is two on my card. Luckily, the uh, app doesn't know anything, so if you're like me, maybe I'll sneak an extra die in there, change it up a little bit. I, I don't think it was a good idea to cheat. Yeah, I don't... I don't feel so good. <sighs> I'm in the game. Dad. Hey, Dad. I'm down here. There's something really creepy behind me, isn't there? How am I gonna get him back? So what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, we're going to be, uh, well, I don't know, actually, but there's going to be some games, obviously, from Essen that we'll be talking about. We're going to be doing a mega unboxing of the things that we brought back from Essen, so some new games that you haven't seen yet. I'm probably going to be reviewing Papillon and um, Pegasus and Wayfinders, so you'll see those games coming out uh, soon. And may uh, who knows? A Q&A today, probably, so come back and check out for that. And, oh, I can tell you this, later on this week we're going to do our top ten holiday-themed games. And uh, then uh, on Friday, me, Roy, Sam, and Z are going to have a showdown with the uh, Funko-verse game. We're going to be drafting stuff, and who the, the champion is going to get to... Kick someone else out of the... No, that's not going to happen. Because <laughs> I might lose and then I'll be gone. But that's going to be happening this Friday. So Roy will be doing the Q&A later on today. That's what's coming out this week. Maybe sort of, kind of. We'll know more as time goes by because I'm recording this like two weeks ahead of time. That's why I look so, so fresh. I'm probably pretty haggard as it is. Let's keep moving. Howdy folks, welcome to By The Numbers. My name is Hunter Thomason from The Family Showdown. This week, we're continuing my Through The Year series, where I look at the top game on Board Game Geek by year, starting with 1970. This week, 1983. Taking a look at the top five, we see the number one game from 1983 is the war game, Up Front, coming in at 455. But it's the 19th ranked war game. Up Front is a World War II man-to-man -man combat simulation game. It's a two-player game. Each player has a deck of cards. It is a card-driven game. The cards act as your troops, your movements, and other actions. Your terrain even acts as the random number generator in the game. Take a look at the ratings. Over 2,000 of them. We see tons of 8s, lots of 9s and 10s for an overall rating of 7.9. Take a look at the weight. It comes in at a 3.39. And doing some research on this game, I came up with a few things I found very interesting. First and foremost... There is no map. But what I found most interesting, the math nerd in me found most interesting, was this concept of relative range. Since we don't have a map, we don't actually move our cards around when we're attacking each other. Basically, each unit starts at a certain distance from each other, marked and basically zero is their range. And if they move forward, they increase that to one and two and so forth. And basically, you take the number five. Why the number five? I don't know. Take the number five, subtract those numbers. And that tells you actually how far they are apart. So if they're both at zero, they're actually five units of distance apart. But if one's at two, the other one's at three, that adds up to five. Now they're at point blank range. <laughs> so if you're looking for a war game that doesn't have a map, that doesn't use dice, doesn't have miniatures, this might be the game for you. <laughs> So what's getting added to the library this week? 
well, Skull Cuddle, this fantastic two-player game. I know a lot of people are going to be enjoying Tris Mestis. Paris New Eden. This is a cool new game coming up. And I haven't played this one, but Z says it's fantastic. That's Farrowin. For our kids' library, we have Sprint. Fun little kids' game. And then we have Freshwater Fly. The total spoilerific version of Clank Legacy is going in the library. As well as the entertaining little game Jetpack Joyride and home brewers and then finally the fantastic game paladins of the west kingdom and bloomtown some great stuff woohoo hi everybody hello we are ryan and bethany from ryan and bethany board game reviews and today we have a special guest with us queen pink we're going to be talking about spooky castle but before we do we're going to bridge the gap between health and board games now queen pink what did you want to tell everybody about push-ups I do 20 a year, and if I don't do 20, I go back to 10. Mm -hmm. Yep, working on your upper body strength, I see. Well, enough about that. Let's get back to Spooky Castle. So this is a cooperative game where you are all taking turns being a junior ghost who's trying to earn its the you know pass a test in order to be the master ghost. So you take turns being blindfolded, trying to navigate through this maze, collecting things with a magnet, uh, and yeah, it's all cooperative. So uh, Queen Pink. What's something that you liked about this game? I liked I liked the magnet and the setting and And that's about it? Yep. What did you dislike about this game? Every single thing except that. <laughs> did you like giving us your parents directions? No, no. Did you like getting directions from us? No, no. Did you like wearing a mask? No, no. You wearing a mask right now. I don't like that mask. Okay. Yeah, this is not a game that we ask for very often. It's a game she never asks for. In fact, she asked to put it, for us to put it in the trade pile in order to make room for a different game. So, uh, yeah, this is not a game that we can't really recommend. If you'd like to hear our full thoughts, go ahead and check out our channel. Yeah, we are Ryan and Bethany, Board Game Reviews. You can find us on YouTube and on Facebook. All right, well, this is Ryan. I'm Bethany. This is guest Queen Pink, encouraging you to play games, live healthy, and create moments. Bye, guys. Hi, Bye, everyone. Buddy. Hey guys, it's Nick, and I'm here for Mental Health Minute, and I want to talk about specifically games that just aren't fun anymore. If you had a game for a long time that you loved, and it was super enjoyable, and it was just so much fun to play, and then years go by, you play it a lot, and you don't really like it anymore. Maybe because a new game comes out that does similar things but better? Maybe because you're just sick of that game you've played it so many times? Or maybe there's a bunch of reasons. What do you do? Do you trade the game away to give it to somebody to enjoy a little bit more? Or do you keep it and shelve it and have it as a decoration or a part of your collection? Or do you hold on to it in hopes that eventually, you know, you'll look back at that game and be like, I want to dust that off. That's, that's a game I want to play. Now, why do we do this? Why do we find games that we're so in debt to and then we don't want to get rid of them? It's part of the bond that you have with the moments in which you're playing. Your brain attaches itself to moments, and those moments attach themselves to what was involved in the moments, and the game is what created many wonderful moments that you were having. So it can be hard to give up or move forward. Some people will cull their collection all at once. That way they can just one full sweep like ripping off a band-aid. Some people do it as is, as time goes by. Just, I'm sick of it, I'm over it, and don't form the connection in the same way. That doesn't mean they don't have a connection to the experience. They can remember the experience without having the box or the game itself, and that's great. And I do like the idea of having somebody else get enjoyment out of it if I can make that happen. What option do you prefer? What do you do with games that you just aren't into anymore? Leave it in the comments below and maybe even an example of one. Enjoy your breakfast. The secret of a good board game a new good board game is to take an old board game that you know is good and re-theme it. Yeah, this happens all the time, right? Lots of companies. I noticed this recently. Osprey Games has been taking games. They re-themed their Wildlands with the Judge Dread theme. They re they re they re they've been re-theming several games with new skins on them. Munchkin has been, you know, Steve Jackson's done this with Munchkin for a while. And many companies will say, hey, I mean, we just talked about this last week. The Marvel Living Card Game was a re-themed version of sorts of the uh, Lord of the Rings card game back in the day. So... 
What do you guys think about that? that that's, it's something I think about a lot, you know, like if a game is a re-themed version or a updated version of an older game and you like that older game, then huzzah, you're happy, right? You already know the game's good and maybe it's a theme that you like, maybe you don't like it, but maybe you like the new theme better and hopefully after a you know, months, years, multiple years, the game will have improved. They have worked better at making this game together. At the same time, sometimes it can come across and you're like, wow, really? You can't come up with a new good game on your own. You have to just do the same old game over and over and over. It's yet another Legendary Encounters. It's yet another version of the DC deck builder. And I get that because I say it. You know, we say it all the time. We're like, oh, here we go again. Same old, same old. But sometimes it's same old, same good. You know, so it depends on where you are. Would you rather have a game you know is good, assuming you like the original game? Would you rather have a game you know is good and they've tweaked it and rethemed it and it's something different? Or would you rather them take a chance in a new game that may or may not be good? See, both things have flaws, but I've noticed that there's more and more because it's the safe thing to do. It's the safe thing to say, well, we know this game works, we know people liked it, and now they'll like it again. We've tweaked it and made it better. As a consumer, it's a comfortable thing. I can come in and say, wow, actually the Marvel Living Card Game wasn't that hard to figure out because I've seen a lot of these things before. So there's that comfort level, which could be equated to laziness. But then sometimes you get a, a company like, we're going to change everything. You, everything in this game, you've never seen any of these mechanisms before. And you're like, oh, that was, that was ambitious, but garbage. And, you know, I guess you want to see things in between. So I never get too concerned when a game comes out and people say, well, there's nothing really new in this game. Fine, but does it work together in a really fun way? I don't care if it's new or not. And if there is something new, then I hope it works in a really fun way. I don't know, there's just something that's been on my mind lately because we're definitely seeing a lot of games rethemed to the point sometimes where a game will come out from a well-known designer. Reiner Kanitsi does this a lot. And I'll say, is this a retheming of an older game? I'm curious because if it is, then that's going to tell me if I like it or not, usually. Uh, and I may not be as interested or may be more interested in it because it's a redone version. One of the games that does on Kickstarter, the Unicorn Fever, is a redone version of Horse Fever. That's fantastic. I'm glad they're redoing that. I'm not as excited when I hear about the newest whatever, whatever munchkin. So, I don't know. Just an interesting thing. That's what I think. Tell me what you think in the comments. Good morning, everybody. My name is Aaron from the Board Game Brothers, and welcome to another episode of Mystery Component Monday, a segment where I show you a picture of a game piece. It's up to you to try to guess what game that piece comes from. So let's put on our thinking caps because here is this week's picture. Okay, time's up, pencils down, and thinking caps off. And the answer to this week's question is Scythe. Scythe takes place in an alternate history timeline of the 1920s, where different factions are vying for power over Eastern Europa. Players take turns trying to gain military power, recruit workers, construct mechs, and build structures, all the while trying to gain popularity amongst the masses. While trying to accomplish certain goals and achievements, players will also be trying to maintain control of the factory in the center of the board, which grants any faction a new ability as long as their leader makes it there unopposed. Scythe is an area control, resource management, action selection game that also has some battles that take place between players. While battles may not take precedence in this game, those mechs were made to battle, and battle they shall. Scythe is played over many rounds until one player has accomplished 6 achievements, at which time all players gain money based on all their achievements completed, areas controlled, and resources obtained at the end of the game, which is then multiplied by how high on the popularity track they are. Money equals points at the end of the game, and the player with the most points wins. And that's this week's game. Congratulations to everybody who got it right, and for everybody else, there's always next week. Until then, I hope you all have a happy breakfast. And there you have it. Another board game breakfast in the books. Here we go. It is now Breakneck 
pace to the end of the year. Essen is over. There's only two more conventions. No, there's only one more convention we're doing this year, and that's PAX Unplugged, which is in December. But we have things coming up. The 24-hour marathon is happening in November. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be neat. There's going to be surprises. There's going to be game contest winners, and I'm going to be making a whole video talking about that. We're going to be announcing all the details of that soon. So keep an eye out for that. Anyway, until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.